and thanks for joining us on another episode. If this is your first time listening to our podcast, Event Buzz is a series where we're talking with different industry experts and professionals in the event space, discussing the latest industry trends, tips, advice, and with the current pandemic, our guests are breaking down strategies and how they are overcoming the challenges of COVID in order to continue putting on events, whether that be in person or online. On today's episode, we have the privilege to talk with the head of the Santa Barbara High School's theater program, discussing the different productions the department has been putting on during COVID. In particular, their student-directed radio plays, which are being broadcasted live for patrons to tune into from their homes. Theater programs everywhere are facing the challenge of continuing their shows and keeping engagement high while we continue to battle this pandemic. But this school is coming together and finding ways to collaborate and produce events, even at a distance. Thanks for joining us today, Justin. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, not bad. Yeah. Let's start with just a little introduction about um, telling me more about the Santa Barbara High School Theater Foundation and the types of events they put on, as well as just a little bit about you and the role that you play, how you're involved with everything. Great. Great. So the Theater Foundation is in a period yeah, of transition right now because the original purpose of the foundation, I believe it was established in the early 2000s, around 2003 or five, And the main purpose it was created was to help renovate, repair, restore the theater because it is an older building and it needs a lot of tender love and care. Mm -hmm. The foundation was originally started with that intention. So they raised money and they were the ones that replaced all the seats in the orchestra level. I think I was told about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that is, so that was their traditional purpose. But over the years, of course, through parent involvement with the production, when Otto Lehman was the director and the artistic director at the school, parents started using the foundation also as a booster club, if you will, for the productions to help support the program. Mm -hmm. So whenever the foundation helps out, there are two things that they're in charge of. One, they figure out fundraising to help restore the building or buy that equipment that we need at the last minute for a production, et cetera. But there's also another sect of it that a certain amount of the money we do for projects goes towards productions at the school. Gotcha. That so the parents sense. really have to like have their hands in two different places because the money is going to different various locations, depending on what the foundation is focusing on supporting in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, I have been voted onto the board as a non-voting member, as the artistic director of the company at Santa Barbara, because I like to look at my program as a theater company. Mm -hmm. um, and so I attend all the meetings with the foundation and coordinating everything. We are right now in the process of reorganizing and reformatting so that we are very clear on expectations and the role that each individual plays within the board. The foundation does fundraisers around town, which this year it's becoming a little more challenging with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that's been a big topic of conversation about how can we fundraise, which mm -hmm. is where things like the radio plays come into play. Yes. Uh -huh. And I'm excited to talk about that because I want to learn more. Um, before we dive right into it, can you tell the listeners more about these radio plays and what they are? Yeah. So there are three radio plays. They're all written and scored by Tony Palermo, who... He writes, uh, he focuses on creating plays for the middle school and high school level, which I love. And he focuses on writing plays in the style of 1940 radio shows, which is awesome. And so there are three of them. The first one is called Detective Rufflethorpe, and it's a good old fashioned English manor murder mystery that we all love. And then the other two are paired up in what he likes to call the grim, scary tales. One of them is called The Pirate's Curse about the fountain of youth at the city of Atlantis. And the other one is called The Buried Treasure Hunters that focuses on uh, one of the battles during the Crusades. 
So it's a little more on the supernatural side. Yeah. It yeah. runs about yeah, 20 to 24 minutes each. So it's a really fun night of entertainment. And I'm, I'm not familiar with radio plays. Is that, is it when you're broadcasting it, are they going to be able to see a picture or is it just like listening to a radio? I don't know if that's not like, if that's a dumb question, but. No, that's actually not a dumb question because many, many people are like, do I have to watch something? Mm -hmm. And I went back and forth in my head because I've done radio plays live before inside of a theater and you get to watch everything. Mm -hmm. But as we were going into this virtual world of virtual performances, I thought, what a better way than to take us back to what it used to be like before the invention of television. And right now, all we are doing all day long, I know I'm a, I'm a, one of those people, I stare at the computer 90% of the day. Mm -hmm. So does everyone now. Oh my God. At the end of the day, I don't want to look at my computer. I just want to go for a walk outside Mm -hmm. to let my brain and my eyes relax. Yeah. So I thought. Let's not see the actors because we could have easily done that route. But I went, no, let's make it where people have to use their imaginations. And all they have to do is focus on listening, which presented a lot of fun challenges for the students because now they had to rely only on their voice. And I think we're in this age of television where we're so used to body language and camera angles helping us tell a story Mm -hmm. on stage we're used to lighting to help us tell a story and our body language but when you take all that away all you have left is your voice so it's really pushed the students to figure out how can i put this into my voice and the tone and the texture and that was fun for the student directors who guided each cast in rehearsal I really like that because I'm definitely the type of person, I mean, I stare at a computer eight hours a day as of most people now because we're working remote. So when I'm done, I like to go outside, maybe throw on like a podcast. I love Spotify and listen to that as I walk or do something. So that is such a great idea on your part. I wouldn't even think about that, but it, it makes total sense because who wants to go from, you know, screen to screen watching TV? We want to go outside. I really like that. Um, and my other question. So now the they're accessible through the entire month of November, correct? The radio plays? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And it's all accessible live streaming. What is the process for accessing these streams? Great. So it's actually very, very simple. So you'll go on to Purple Pass, uh, um, purplepass.com slash SBHS theater. That's an RE in theater. Mm-hmm. And you'll go to the radio plays and you'll click on it and you'll purchase the ticket. The ticket is $20 per link. So I look at it as a family of four can just pay $20 and sit back and have a night of entertainment. Mm -hmm. Um, And what happens is you get an email and there's a link in the email that Purple Pass sends you. You click on the link and it opens up a URL that you copy and paste into your browser and that's it. Simple. But it's super link, simple. Does it expire or how, how does that work? Do they have a certain- I believe it does expire. I believe it does expire. This is the first time we're doing this. So this mm-hmm. is the very yeah, no, yeah. experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I am not a technology guy whatsoever. Um, I'm much more hands-on. That's why I love doing theater. Mm-hmm. So we are figuring this process out and we'll get the kinks figured out. So when we do our virtual cabaret in January, we'll have everything smoothed out by then. So this is technically your first time live streaming, like first live stream events? Yeah. That's oh, amazing. ever. Ever? In my, like, even my life, even for just side of Santa Barbara. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you are not alone. Trust me, I've talked to so many people and everyone is in the same boat. So you're not alone. Everyone's just trying to figure it out. Um, and again, yeah. since I'm talking to all these people and everyone uses so many different softwares, I always like to ask what um, software you're using for broadcasting these radio plays because there's so many out there. So just to give everyone an idea. Um, yeah, there's just so many out there. And every time I ask someone, it's something new. So I'm curious what you guys are using. Yeah, 
So we are going very, very simple and basic, at least for our first time around. Mm -hmm. um, I've posted it onto my YouTube channel and it's not viewable by anyone mm -hmm. unless you have like the embedded link, et cetera. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And so with Purple Pass, they actually have a widget for it. So once you purchase it, Purple Pass takes care of the rest. Gotcha. So simple, a simple, simple process and you're using YouTube. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, Santa Barbara High School Theater has been using Purple Pass for a while now. So we already have an account on there. Mm -hmm. So this was just one extra great thing that we could add on to. Oh, great. Now we can have this option. Yeah. Which opens up so many opportunities down the road mm -hmm. for people out of town that can't make it for a musical. We could always upload our musical now and still have people pay to see our production for a limited time. Yeah. Because, so like a hybrid event or something. Well, that's exactly it because every um, rights company out there now pretty much has streaming rights for a lot of the popular shows now. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay a little more, but mm -hmm. hey, if I have the option of doing a musical in the auditorium, but then I can post three performances online for people out of town who can't afford to fly across the country, why not? Mm -hmm. Let's, I mean, that's the, we all hate this virtual world. I know I do. But at least let's find the positive out of it mm -hmm. that we're forced to do things that we normally wouldn't have done. And we're discovering ways that we can still implement them once we get through this. Yeah. And that's such a common trend. I've I've heard from listening to everyone, all these different promoters trying out streaming for the first time. A lot of people don't like it. And I don't I don't blame them because a lot of these people like you guys are going from in-person events, interacting hands on to virtual and it's not the best. But. They are finding the positives, like you said, people out of town can now see the shows and um, you're accessing a, a broader range of audience. You're getting more people can be a part of the showing. So I think that's cool because once eventually, fingers crossed, when we can go back to in-person events, I think a lot of our promoters are, are going to keep, like you said, doing hybrid so more people can access it. So I I think there is some positives that that have come out of this horrible virus like we found new ways <laughs> to yes. reach people so i mean you're right we have to put that positive spin on it for now just to get us through it but yeah i think hybrid events are definitely going to be there's going to be a lot more from here on out and how has your overall experience transitioning from in person to live streaming events been so far like i know you've said you're missing the hands on but what has been probably the biggest challenge for you the biggest challenge I have is, it, it is so funny, it's so simple, but mm -hmm. I despise talking through a screen. <laughs> um, even, I'm, I'm, I'm even talking like pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah. I used to, whenever I would, for instance, like meeting someone for the first time for a project, I hate a phone conversation because I'm all about looking at body language yeah. and feeling like the physical chemistry between two people. Mm -hmm. And I feel, you know, as an artist and as a director, when I'm interviewing, let's say, costume designers for a show, I have to make sure we can get along as human beings before I can even hire you to do a show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we don't get along as human beings, we're never gonna work as artists. <laughs> And, yeah. and for me, a lot of it's like, let's grab a coffee and let's just talk, mm -hmm. you know? And that's where I'm struggling with the most is that's the hardest transition. Even as a teacher, I am so used to being able to pull kids to the side privately one-on-one -on -one for a quick second in class, do a little whisper conversation and then jump right back in. So I miss that intimate quality I can do in person. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I feel that too. Like doing these podcasts, you can't see me. So it's very hard. So I always try to do like, mm -hmm, or like, so you know that I'm listening. Yes, I'm, yes. It's hard. It's hard to do a relationship on a screen versus in person. So I do struggle with that too. And I'm sure everyone out there is that, that have, has gone from, especially uh, 
theater program and teaching that's such a hands-on thing so uh -huh. kudos kudos for you like you, you've gotten this far you're still doing it like good job because that's very hard oh it's it's very hard and i'm not alone when i say this because i've talked with all my other theater teacher friends many tears have been had in private yeah. many you many, are not alone <laughs> many tears of frustration and the overwhelming sensation that this has put not only on me but on the students because mm -hmm. they're wanting that physical interaction as well like mm -hmm. they want that in-person experience because it's so vital for us as people yeah and i our teachers are just they've been amazing during this whole time like really stepped up every teacher that's not used to um doing all these working online and working with children through screens i feel like you guys have been awesome to like get the students through this time so again good job like really <laughs> take pride in your work you're doing awesome um on that note eventually when you guys are able to host in-person events again theater productions how do you foresee your shows going moving forward i know we talked about doing maybe hybrid events but but are there any like new protocols or procedures that you've thought about putting in place to ensure the safety of guests when they transition back to these in-person events? Yeah, one of the things, I've talked about this actually a couple weeks ago with my foundation president, Josie Devine, that right now, currently, I've been told by my administration, we are doing a show in the spring. Great, so we are doing a show on stage, which is exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Whether there will be people in the audience or not, that's a bigger question. Yeah. But our guess is that, like, like a lot of places here in California, in our area, 25% capacity. So we have 800 seats total. So we figure somewhere about 150 to 200 seats we could potentially sell. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to do this, we are going to figure out through Purple Pass a way that we can block off a good chunk of seats mm -hmm. and leave more rows open, if you will, because we want, like if a family of four comes, they should be able to sit together because they're all from the same home, just like they're doing in the movie theaters. Like that's one of our yeah. things we're looking at where they sort of space you out by who you Group. come to the theater with. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's going to be experiment because once again, we've never done this before. Are people going to be smart enough to be like, okay, people are sitting there. We need to pick seats away from them. Yeah. It's going, and then once we're in the theater, we may have to move people around and adjust as we go. Um, that's going to be the big thing. Um, We'll probably most likely have hand sanitizer when you walk in the theater, in the lobby. We'll most likely not allow people, normally people in our theater wait in an inside interior hallway, the main hallway of the school. We'll mm -hmm. most likely have people wait outside in front of the school. That's where everything will most likely take place so that we're not in an enclosed space. Um, and we'll keep the theater open on the sides and in the back as long as we can until showtime. We might even have to figure out a way to do shows, leaving some of the side doors open to get fresh ventilation through the theater. Once again, this is all going to be experimental yeah. as we approach it. Um, so not only for the audience members, but then we have to go, then the union side of my head as an actor goes, wait a minute, we're on stage. We mm -hmm. also socially distance on stage and backstage. Yeah, I was just about to ask that. Because I always have people go, why don't we do a show of 20? And I go, well, that's nice. But what's going to happen backstage in the green room? And mm -hmm. all at once, all of them go, oh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's right. That's right, kids. So it's one of those things where now I'm experimenting with, OK, can I do a show with 10 to 15 people? And is there a way that I can keep them on stage the entire time? <laughs> where they never leave the stage and then we ensure that we're always socially distanced yeah uh, i just got done talking to um a different promoter working with theater and they're only allowed to have max 12 students on stage at a time 
Mm-hmm. So they've been, it's been a challenge for them too. They're doing it in like little breaks and stuff. So. Well, and that's where, you know, it's, especially in the spring when we do a show, I'm looking to do a show that's maybe not so through line, but more of a vignette type show. Mm-hmm. Cause then it's easier to rehearse and yeah. easier to face out if you're only working with two to four kids at a time. And then you sort of puzzle it all together and you move on. Yeah. You'll figure it out. I mean, like you said, it's everyone's trying to figure it out and get creative. At the same time, I think your audience, your parents are aware of this. So everyone's going to be very accepting and understanding if it's not a perfect show. Well, and everyone, including myself, we are starving for live action theater. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like we talked about earlier, there's only so much staring at the screen you can do before you want to pull your hair out. You know? (laughs) Yeah. I agree. Um, And to close out, is there any um, just advice you would give other program, other theater programs, promoters out there also trying to keep their department alive, provide engagement for their students? Like you said, just keep it going during this pandemic. (sighs) Um. Yeah, I think I would say be patient Mm -hmm. Um, when choosing shows, simple is better. Um, Utilize students beyond the capacity of acting. So my, for instance, my radio plays are all student directed. Mm. I had three students take charge and then I mentored them And I actually got to act as the producer and I got to guide everyone. And that took a lot of pressure off me, but it also empowered the kids to own it a little more. Mm -hmm. And I think with online theater, it's the same with in person, but with online, because we're so distant, the more we can empower them to connect as a group and to lead themselves, I think we'll have successful productions. And I would say, ask for help. There's nothing wrong with asking for help going, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, yeah. and, and someone online will come to the rescue. Just use, use your Facebook and Instagram as I did it on Facebook when I was having trouble uploading my MP4 to YouTube. And one of my friends from 15 years ago, who I never talked to that much, <laughs> he wrote me. And he helped me out. There you <laughs> so go. Yeah. Always ask for help because, like you've mentioned, we are all new to this, and theater people are not used to all the technology. Mm-hmm. So it's okay to ask and take advice from people. Yes, there's always someone to answer your question on the internet. There is millions oh. of Facebook groups. Go join one. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. a group for everything. I swear. Oh yes, for sure. So. Yeah, great advice. Great advice. Everyone just everyone listening just know you are not alone. <laughs> Everyone's in the same boat as you. Ask for help. We are here. Thanks so much for talking to me today, Justin. Thank you, Savannah. <laughs>